There's probably never been a time in history where the things that affect the 99%, working class people, but also a big section of middle class people, are very similar, to some extent globally, but certainly across Europe. I mean, obviously there are differences. But when you hear Daniel talking about the austerity that you're facing here in Northern Ireland, the same thing could be repeated in Britain, in France, in Greece, on an even worse scale, in every country, whether or not it's Cameron doing it with glee, implementing austerity, or Hollande in France doing it a bit more reluctantly, or Syriza in Greece getting elected and saying that they're opposed to austerity, <coughs> but now being under the cosh from the Troika and the Eurozone to say you've got to implement austerity, everywhere the same issues are being posed. And in every country, there is no lack of money. I'm not going to give loads of statistics about how much the rich have got, because you've probably all heard them before. But I mean, just in the last five years in Britain, then we had something like £80 million worth of cuts in public spending. Coincidentally, that is exactly the same amount as the bankers have had in bonuses since the crisis began in 2008. So there's not a lack of money. It's a question of who owns and controls that money. The richest thousand people, its income went down in 2009 marginally, but that was the only year. Every other year, it's just continued to soar. So we're suffering austerity, while there's a few at the top who are doing very nicely indeed. And I think the title of tonight's meeting is about how can we fight austerity? Is it possible to stop these constant cuts that are raining down on the heads of working class people? Now, the first thing that we would say is it's wrong to think that people are just accepting it, that they're not fighting back. Because across Europe, we have already seen determined struggles against austerity. I mean, not at the same time in every country. Each country has its kind of own rhythm of struggle, but important movements have taken place everywhere. If you look at the south of Ireland, for a long time, the national capitalist newspapers in the south were actually describing ordinary people as sheeple because they were so wet, they just took whatever anybody threw at them. Now they're being decried as the mob because of the water charges campaign because they've got up off their knees and they're fighting back. You had the public sector strike taking place just weeks before the general election. In Britain, Nobody, including Cameron, expected the Tories to win a majority government. It's an incredibly weak government. They got 24% of the vote. That is the lowest, or not the vote, of the electorate. That is the lowest proportion of the electorate to vote for a Tory prime minister since 1918. So they're not popular, but they got a majority government. So people are a bit in shock. But already, just six weeks after the election, Last weekend, last Saturday, and this might be why my voice might go in this speech, because it was a, a loud and noisy and long demonstration, but up to a quarter of a million people marched through the streets of London against austerity. Overwhelmingly, they were young people who had never been on a demonstration before, but just had the feeling, no one's coming to rescue us, the Tories have been elected, we've got to start to fight back and do something. So people have been, are prepared to fight against austerity, but nonetheless, while we've won some victories and we have forced back big business and different governments on this or that issue, overall, you can't say that the 99% of the ordinary people have been the winners. Overall, they've managed to implement vicious austerity against us. So I suppose tonight's discussion is about why is that and what can we do to change it? In the Socialist Party, in England and Wales, also here in Ireland, then we would say... Ordinary people are not powerless. We do have the potential to change things. After all, with the strike that you had before the general election in March, even that showed the potential of working class people to bring society to a halt if they all come out on strike together. When we flex our muscles, we can win. Actually, since the general election, it's not just young people demonstrating in Britain, but we've also seen an increase in the number of strikes taking place and in particular, the seriousness of those strikes. People are going on all-out strike, which was considered a thing of the past five years ago, and fighting until they succeed in winning. And sometimes, winning victories without going on strike at all. Network Rail were threatened with strike action over a poxy pay increase, 
And so they increased the offer. The, the reps met and said it's not enough and demanded more. And Network Rail were forced to increase the offer again. And that means that those rail workers have succeeded in breaking the public sector pay freeze in Britain at this point in time. And they've done that because they were militant and because they were determined in the strike action that took place. And we're going to see more of it. The London Underground, for the first time in a decade, all three trade unions on the London Underground have voted to come out on strike together over pay. That will bring the network completely to a halt. The City of London will not function when the London Underground is on strike. ASLEF, traditionally perhaps the more conservative of the unions on London Underground, voted 98.7% <coughs> in favour of action on an 81% turnout for that strike that is going to take place. That is, let's put it like this, that's putting two fingers up to the anti-trade union laws that the government are threatening to introduce. And it shows The Economist, the right-wing magazine, have warned the government, even if you get away with introducing these anti-trade union laws, it's going to backfire on you because actually it will make the trade union movement more militant. What you can see beginning to take place in Britain at the moment in the aftermath of the election is really learning lessons of the battle we've been through in the last five years about what is necessary to defeat austerity. And we would say that one of the central lessons people are beginning to learn is that this is not a small thing. It's not just a policy by a few nasty politicians and Bullingdon boys and the rest of them. It's something more than that. This is the attempt of the capitalist class, a few at the top, to restore their profits after the economic crisis by driving down the living conditions for the rest of us. They're trying to restore their sick system to health by making us pay in terms of wage restraint, but also taking away the gains we won in the past of a health service, the right to retire and get a pension, all of the other things that we won historically. And they're not easily going to stop doing that. They're determined to carry that through. The only way we will stop them is by fighting. You look at what the Tories have done since they've been re-elected. I mean, it's a joke, really. Osborne, the Chancellor, has set up this committee to consider public debt that has not met since 1860. I mean, it's laughable, but it's also serious. Because if they can get away with it, they will return our living conditions to the Victorian era. They would like a day where the only welfare state that existed was the workhouse. And if you couldn't afford to work, if you couldn't afford to live, you couldn't make enough working to live, then that was where you were ended up. Now, as Daniel referred to, of course, it's not restoring their system to health. And it's interesting, as far as the British government's concerned, that lots of serious capitalist commentators, even the IMF, the OECD, the OBR, which is the government's own quango, all these people love austerity, but they're saying... Britain's austerity is going too far. Slow down. Don't do so much. And the reason they're saying that is partly because they can see that it could push the economy back into recession. And maybe they realise better than this government that the so-called so recovery has been based on reinflating the debt bubbles which burst when the crisis began. Personal indebtedness is now back up to the level of 2004 and is set within three years to be higher than it was at the time the crisis started. So they can see the weakness of the recovery, but also they fear the revolt that is coming. And in our view, it is only by revolting and fighting back that we will be able to stop this onslaught and doing it in a determined way. It will not, you know, capitalist commentators, the IMF can say, oh, carry out a bit less austerity. It's not going to make any difference to Osborne. Just as, by the way, the CBI, the bosses' organisation, <laughs> recommended last year that the minimum wage should be increased. And they said, we want to increase the minimum wage because that way people will have more money in their pockets and they'll be able to buy more of our goods. Well, there's a logic to that from their point of view. Except then they ask them, how many of you are going to increase the wages of your employees? 7%. Because it's one thing to want someone else to increase wages so you can sell more things. It's altogether another to cut across your own profits by actually increasing the wages of workers. We will only get it if we fight for it. So we've got a serious battle on our hands. And looking back, some of you are too young probably to look back, but if you look back to the state, if you like, of the workers' movement, of workers' organisations, when this economic crisis hit, we were not prepared for the kind of battles that we were going to face. That meant that the trade unions 
while still extremely powerful organisations, over 6 million members in Britain, potentially the strongest organisations in society, had been weakened compared to what they'd had in the 70s and the 80s, had suffered defeats. In terms of political organisations, the idea that the Labour Party was a party in Britain that would represent working class people had been smashed, really. We had Mandelson saying we're intensely relaxed about people getting filthily rich and deregulating the city like crazy over the time that New Labour were in power. And at the same time, and the same was true in every country of similar parties, and at the same time, the idea that there's a possibility of an alternative to capitalism, that socialism is possible, was something that was not widely understood. So given all of those things, it's not surprising that if you like, in the first rounds of the battle against austerity, we won a few things, but mostly we got beaten. But out of those brutal defeats, people are starting to learn the lessons about what is necessary to make sure we win next time. And I do want to spend a little bit of time on Greece, because there, if you like, not just for Greek workers, for whom it's extremely brutal, you know, their, their economy has contracted by 25%. That makes the Great Depression look mild. It's an incredible catastrophe that has taken place. But it's not just for Greek workers, it's worse for them. But of course, workers across Europe are watching what is taking place in Greece and thinking, can we defeat austerity? Or is this going to show that the Troika are all-powerful and there's nothing that we can do? I mean, the first point that we would make is the election of Syriza as an anti-austerity party itself shows that anti-austerity ideas are popular. And it's not true that we've got to accept the lesser evil all the time. You know, we get told you've got no choice but to vote Labour in Britain because the others are even worse. But when Syriza made the breakthrough and got elected... There were a few people who unfortunately a bit worshipped the accomplished fact, who were like, isn't it fantastic? Syriza has been elected. But they didn't draw the conclusion, and this includes Len McCluskey, the leader of the biggest trade union in Britain and also a major trade union here as well. They didn't draw the conclusion, well, five years ago, Syriza was getting less than 5% of the vote. And PASOK, the equivalent of the Labour Party, was in government and carrying out austerity. And as a result, PASOK is now an ex-party, and Syriza has been thrust into power with huge popular support, particularly in the first period when they said they were going to stand firm against the Troika. 100,000 people on the streets in Athens, similar-sized demonstrations across Greece. Now, we warned, that's fantastic, but it's not going to be so easy to defeat the Troika and the institutions of European uh, capitalism. They will put enormous pressure on Syriza and the Greek population to submit to austerity. And this is not primarily economic. Greece is tiny economically. It's 2% of the Eurozone's economy. The Troika can't afford to bail Greece out and say no more austerity. There's no question about that. And yet they're trying to make Syriza an elected democratic government. These unelected clique are trying to make them crawl over the coals. Why is that? Because they recognise if Syriza are seen to win and the Greek population get the things that they elected Syriza for, an end to austerity, better pay, etc., etc., renationalisation of what's been privatised, then workers in Spain in Portugal, in Italy, are going to say, in Ireland, we want a bit of the same thing. So it's political. They don't want anti-austerity to be seen to one, and therefore they are determined to try and beat the Syriza government. And our Greek sister organisation, Zakinema, would say that unfortunately, much of the leadership of Syriza were kind of under an illusion that they were going to be able to charm the Troika, you know, <coughs> go around looking stylish in nice outfits and make witty comments and they might have charmed a lot of people across Europe but they're not going to charm the Troika because they are absolutely determined to crush what is taking place in Greece. Mm. So very quickly the Syriza government made a retreat. Now the attitude of the Greek population to that, this is not what's taken place in the last few days but what took place in the weeks after they were first elected the attitude of the majority of the Greek population to that was, fair enough, you're buying time um, to live to fight another day. We accept you've had no choice but to step back. And Syriza remained extremely popular. At 70% in the opinion polls, even 60% of Golden Dawn, who were fascist thugs, 60% of their voters were supporting what Syriza was doing because they saw that they were standing up to austerity. 
And our attitude was not to say it's outrageous that you've had to make a compromise, but to say there's two issues here. One is you tell workers the truth. If you're forced to step back, you say what's really happened. You don't come back from the negotiations and claim to have won because the Troika have now agreed to be called the institutions, which was really what was all that was in that first uh, agreement. You tell the truth that you've had no choice but to hold back, to, to make a concession in order to buy time, but also you buy time to do something. You buy time to prepare to build a movement to defy and to defeat the Troika, which unfortunately was not done at that point in time. And since then, in the agreement that took place, well, agreement, the proposal by Syriza, because of course it's not an agreement, that was put forward yesterday, we think it's wrong of the Syriza leadership to say they have not crossed their red lines. Because actually, if you look at it, then it's eight billion pounds of your eight billion euros that is going to the lenders, which is going to be taken out of the Greek economy. That's 4.5% of GDP. And yes, it's in taxation mainly, but that taxation is mainly VAT, which affects the poorest in society because everybody has to pay it, but it also includes increased uh, uh, funds, increased contributions to pension and social security funds. So in our view, that was a major retreat that took place, and it was absolutely wrong to dress it up as a victory. But of course, it turned out not to be enough. They're determined to punish them. And they're saying even that is not enough. The IMF are saying they want 80% of the measures to come from spending cuts in Greece. I mean, it's just horrific. And only 10, 20% to come from tax increases. So it's now not clear what is going to happen, whether Syriza will make further concessions or whether they will be forced out of the Eurozone because it's just too much for the government to swallow given the mass opposition that exists at home. Now, if Syriza submit, that will be a blow to the Greek working class, of course, but also in the short term to workers across Europe. I mean, there will be a section will draw the conclusions about what Syriza needed to do to win, but there will be many more that will think, Jesus, that means we can't fight. However, the game is not finished yet. It's still going on. And by the way, even if the majority of the leadership of Syriza sign up to an absolutely rotten deal and they've shown that they're prepared to move in that direction, it doesn't follow that Syriza as a whole will do. It's a coalition. There are big elements in it that are opposed to what is taking place. Up till now, they have largely organised inside Syriza and not really publicly criticised. The time for that has gone. The time has gone to, to come to vote against what is put forward in Parliament and to call on the Greek working class to take to the streets and to fight back, as they have done previously, uh, to the deal that is being proposed. And on the basis of that, events can still shift. Now, if Syriza had stood firm, or if a split from Syriza stands firm and is then able to win an election, which you can't exclude in this situation, what would that mean? How can they win? There's no question they would be chucked out of the Eurozone. They could be chucked out of the Eurozone anyway. And there's also no question that on a capitalist basis, then that would mean misery. It would mean going back to the drachma, that means massively devalued, and that would mean that imported goods, which Greece is, Greece is largely reliant on, becoming expensive, very expensive. I mean, whether it means even they've suffered a huge amount of misery, whether it's more misery than what they're going to suffer inside, but it wouldn't be a good scenario. But that doesn't mean that they have to accept that. There are other alternatives. We would say in Greece, but they need to move immediately to introduce capital controls, to stop, and they should have already done this, to stop money flowing out of the country. The banks are formally nationalised, but they're still in the hands of a tiny elite to put them under popular democratic control, but also to take the major industry in Greece into democratic public ownership and begin to build an emergency plan of production to, hold, to house people, to provide food, to provide jobs. And if they were to do that... It would be enormously popular in Greece, but it would also spread. Because they would say, we want a real federation of Europe, not the EU that is run by this tiny elite. We want workers to come together, and we call on workers in Spain, in Portugal, across the whole of Europe, but particularly in that southern belt, to join with us in building something better. That idea would spread like wildfire. Now, by the way, that's a socialist programme that I've just outlined. But even in Greece, which have had 30 general strikes, have fought like hell, are absolutely opposed to austerity, 
it would not be true at the moment to say that the majority of the population will consider themselves socialist. Far from it. But they do consider themselves absolutely anti-austerity. And a government that implemented a programme that could help start to prevent austerity and said this is democratic socialism would repopularise socialist ideas. They would be very popular for a whole new generation. Now, I'm sure people want to comment on this in the discussion. Varoufakis, uh, the, uh, the, the finance minister, I must take my card off, it's really hot. Varoufakis, the finance minister, has said, well, we can't break with capitalism. Because if we break with capitalism, then it will only be the far right that grow, golden dawn. And therefore, our job is to rescue capitalism. But unfortunately, what they're doing shows that actually the opposite is true. It's not possible to have a humane capitalism without austerity, the Troika approving that. And by accepting austerity, then they can end up strengthening golden dawn rather than fighting to build a socialist alternative and being prepared to stand up to capitalism both in Greece and internationally. But this is important because even though in the short term, if Syriza are defeated, there can be a mood that we can't fight amongst big sections of workers across Europe. There will also be a layer who are watching events and who draw the conclusion, not that we can't fight, but that you need <coughs> fundamental change. You need socialism in order to change things. And it will really be the first example in this era of those issues being posed because we've just had neoliberal governments in Europe. So the idea of them standing up to anything and what happens when you do is not something that people have thought about, but it is now being posed concretely. And even if there is a temporary mood of we can't fight amongst some people, that will not last because we're going to have no choice. And the pace of events in our own countries, the austerity that we're facing, means people will have no choice but to fight back against austerity. As I said earlier, that is shown already by what is a new phase of the struggle that is taking place in Britain at the weekend. We had the, uh, in Britain at the moment, we had the huge demonstration at the weekend. But even before that, in the days after the general election, five sixth formers in Bristol called a demonstration against austerity and 5,000 people turned up. Youth Fight for Jobs, which we lead, called protests on the day of the Queen's speech. In Leeds, they called it, and within one night, 2,500 people had said they were coming. We don't have 2,500 members of Youth Fight for Jobs in Leeds. Um, 1,000 people did turn up in the pouring rain to protest, and there were other similar protests across uh, the country. Those young people may not have protested before, but it doesn't mean they've learnt nothing from what has gone on over the last five years. Some of the lessons have sunk in. So it was very noticeable on the demonstration that took place Nobody thought that a demonstration could beat the Tories. They were glad to be there, it was a good start, but they all understood it's going to take more to defeat this government than that. And the question everybody was asking is, what do we do next? We were calling for a 24-hour general strike. That got huge applause. For most young people, they were not in trade unions. But the idea we've all got to strike together against austerity was understood by them. Unfortunately... The speakers from the platform did not call, generally, for a 24-hour general strike, or really for much action at all. Mark Savotka, the General Secretary for PCS, did. He didn't use the words 24-hour general strike, but he said, we've all got to go on strike together, so good enough. That was pretty clear. But others really stepped back from what they'd raised under the last government. Len McCluskey, the General Secretary of Unite, only called for people to demonstrate at the Tory party conference, which is just another demonstration. And there is a real danger here. That demonstration in London was not called by the trade unions. It was called by the People's Assembly. But the People's Assembly is funded by the trade unions. 12 national trade unions, including the TUC, supported that demonstration. That's great. I'm not complaining about them supporting a demonstration. But what we're complaining about is if they then say, job done, we've opposed austerity, we've supported this demonstration, instead of acting directly, uh, directly to give a lead for more serious action. It has to be used as a launch pad. There is an idea in the trade union movement in Britain at the moment, it's been raised by Francis O'Grady, the General Secretary of the TUC, well, it's not about organising old industrial workers or public sector workers, now it's the baristas and the zero-hour contracts workers and the cleaners, and they're really hard to organise. So what we should have is consumer boycotts, honestly. 
What a load of old nonsense. I'm not opposed necessarily to consumer boycotts, but for the leader of the trade union movement to put that forward as the way that you're going to fight, it's an absolute abdication. In reality, if the unions were to call a 24-hour general strike against austerity and against the new anti-trade union laws, there would be millions of those baristas and cleaners and young people on zero-hour contracts who would be able to see the point of being in the trade union movement for the first time and would be drawn uh, would be drawn into it the other argument that's given against it is well it's not possible legally to call a 24-hour general strike well the anti-union laws that we've got coming in show that if we don't fight soon it won't be possible to legally do anything so we've got no choice and actually you could get a long way towards a 24-hour general strike just by coordinating ballots of all of the different grievances that workers in unions have up and down the country but it's necessary to go further than that and to say Everyone should come out. And any union that is threatened with sequestration, workers that are disciplined, we will strike again in their defence. This is an issue that the other thing that's raised is can a general strike win? One 24-hour general strike. After all, the Greeks had 30 and they haven't won. Is it possible? We would say in answer to that, Northern European culture is quite different to Southern European. So even though 30 general strikes is a lot by any country's imagination, in Britain or in Ireland, a one-day general strike would be a big shock to the capitalists because they've not seen one for a long period of time. But actually, the reason those 30 general strikes didn't win is because many of them as there were, it was still the trade union leaders calling action to say they'd done something rather than as a serious strategy to win. And we are not automatically saying that one 24-hour general strike would stop this government. But we are saying, if you come out and say we will come out again until we win then that's much more likely to frighten them into retreating after one 24-hour general strike. And by the way, not just stop the new trade union legislation getting on the statute books, but really, in reality, push aside the anti-trade union legislation, that uh, legislation that we already have. This government is not all-powerful that we have in Britain. It can be defeated. And actually, even the last government, which was stronger than this one in terms of its parliamentary base, how many people had voted for it, and so on, that government could have been defeated. If you look back to the peak of the movement against austerity in Britain, it was three quarters of a million people marching in 2011, and then the public sector general strike that took place in November of that year. Unfortunately, the trade union leaders called that action, and in most cases they'd already decided to call it off before it even took place. It was the idea we want to be with before any, you know, after the call off any further action before it had even taken place. They wanted to be seen to do something, but they were not prepared to conduct a serious struggle and they effectively told us, wait for Labour. A Labour government is going to save you. Well, that idea is certainly in tatters now. And they bear responsibility, not just for derailing a struggle against austerity, not that there wasn't any after that. There were many unions like Nipsa did heroically in the north here, the PCS did uh, in Britain. There were many unions that did keep fighting, but there was not the same generalised action that took place. They bear responsibility, not just for austerity being continued, but also for the growth of the horrible Tory right-wing populace in UKIP, who are now surging in working-class constituencies where people would rather die than vote Tory, they're voting for UKIP, people who are a right-wing split from the Tory party because they're posing as being anti-austerity. Now, you might say, what's that got to do with the trade union leaders? At the time that we had that three-quarters of a million strong demonstration against cuts, a week later, UKIP called a demonstration in favour of cuts. 200 people turned up. That was the balance of power at that point in time. But, of course, because that movement didn't continue and people are frustrated and angry and wanted to lash out and they were offered UKIP as a means by which to do uh, that. And unfortunately, and I need to sum up, but the reality is that uh, even compared to 2011, the, the, not all, but the majority of the union leaders at the moment seem to have stepped back a bit in terms of what they're prepared to call. At that stage, they were considering a general strike, even though they never called it. At this point, they're not even raising the idea of a general strike. In our view, in a way, that, in a, that, that's them recognising how serious this is. There is a comparison to the period before the 1926 general strike, when Lloyd George, who was not a stupid man, got the trade union leaders in his office, and he said, look, you can bring this country to a halt. You can hold the power. 
But if you do that, what happens in this country is on your head. You take responsibility. And the trade union leader said, well, at that point, we knew we were beaten because they weren't prepared to take the power. Now, that did not prevent the 26th general strike, but it did delay it for a considerable period of time. And there's an element this here that this is serious. It means being prepared to take on capitalism, to fight a real battle. And unfortunately, a whole layer of the union leaders have stepped back. Now, that doesn't mean that they can't be pushed to act. And we are campaigning via the National Shop Stewards Network, which is rank and file, trade unionists, workplace reps, to put pressure on, to demand that a demonstration is called on the first day of the anti-union laws as, dis as dis discussed in Parliament, but also to say to the left union leaders, if the TUC won't, you have to coordinate. And there are steps in that direction. The RMT, the Transport Workers Union, have just unanimously passed a motion, not just calling for a 24-hour general strike in the abstract, but saying if the TUC don't act, they want to discuss with the PCS, with the FBU, with a, and form a coalition of the willing to begin to build that kind of strike action. And even if the union leaders are able to act as an obstacle for a while, that won't prevent people fighting back, because we've got no choice. But it may happen in local strikes, and also through different forms. After all, the water charges, it's not come through the trade unions. On the contrary, it's come from below. In our history in Britain... Maggie Thatcher was not got rid of by the organised trade union movement. She was got rid of by the anti-poll tax movement, which we led and came from below. 18 million people refusing to pay the tax. But one of the differences here is we are starting to see against the bedroom tax, against the evictions that are taking place on housing, on different social issues, the disability campaigners who charged into Parliament yesterday. We're beginning to see different local community struggles. But they're on a myriad of different issues and if the trade unions were to give a lead, it could act as a backbone to unite those different struggles together, which is more, we will fight to do it in the Socialist Party, but it's more difficult, uh, it, more, more difficult without them playing that central role. However, even if in the short term it's not possible in terms of a generalised anti-austerity struggle, we think we can fight to do it on the electoral front. And these will just be the last points that I make. Because it was clear, actually, in the general election, anti-austerity <coughs> ideas were popular. 9% of people in England said they wanted to vote SNP. You obviously were not standing a single candidate in England. Now, actually, this is a bit like Martin McGuinness being invited to speak at the demonstration in London last Saturday. People in England think the SNP are anti-austerity. Actually, they have carried through cuts in Scotland, just as Sinn Féin uh, have done here. But that's, people were supporting them because they perceived them as being anti-austerity. It was the fact that Labour <coughs> just accepted austerity that meant that they were not able to win the general election. But we are going to be... But we stood as part of something called the Trade Unionist and Socialist Coalition in 135 parliamentary seats, over 500 local election seats in that general election. And we were doing it to establish the name and establish a 100% anti-austerity alternative. We got 118,000 votes, which is a modest vote, and we knew that we would get a relatively modest vote in these elections because many of the people who wanted to vote for us could see the opinion polls were neck and neck and thought, we, we don't like Labour, we've got no choice. We've got to go and vote for them to try and stop the Tories being elected. But we were doing it to prepare for the future and particularly for prepare what is going to take place in the trade unions, where in the big trade unions, the idea that they should keep funding Labour is leading to boiling discontent going to be a little bit easier for them for a little bit because Jeremy Corbyn who is actually left wing has got onto the ballot paper but when the trade union leaders are trying to say that Andy Burnham a man who held his launch in Ernst & Young the international tax avoidance company was the left wing alternative they were going to face real problems at the union conferences this year over the idea that they should keep funding labour the idea of stopping funding labour is gaining momentum but in our view, the answer is not non-political trade unionism. We need a political voice. The unions have to start to build something new. And the trade unionist and socialist coalition is preparing the ground for that in the work that we are doing. That will really come to the fore in next year's local elections. Because even the local government association, which is led by the Tories, are saying that having suffered 40% cut in funding over the last five years... Any more cuts, they will cease to exist. There just won't be local councils in any real sense. Now, there are going to be more cuts. And then the question is going to be, what do Labour councillors do? What do Green councillors do? What does the Scottish Parliament do? <coughs> and just like here, 
it will be the argument, not from all necessarily, but from most of them, well, we've got no choice but to carry through the cuts. We have to act. We'll, we'll soften it slightly the way that we do it. You can't soften cutting by more than 50% the funding of local councils. The time has come to say we are not going to make the cuts. We will use our reserves. And by the way, hardly any of them have. They have huge reserves while they're carrying out these cuts. We will use our potential borrowing powers where we can in order not to implement any cuts. And we will build a movement, as was done in Liverpool in the 1980s, to defeat the government and to oppose cuts. Now, there may be some councillors who find their backbone in the face of the misery. And where there is, Tusk will support them. But otherwise, we are going to say to all of the disparate bits of the anti-cuts movement, the anti-bedroom tax campaigners, the disability campaigners, the workers on strike, let's unite together in the elections and stand candidates who are prepared to not just cry about the cuts, but actually vote against them and build a movement against them. And that can be quite significant in next year's elections. Now, in our view, to put 100% anti-austerity alternative means to put a socialist alternative. That doesn't mean we're suggesting that you can't win things from big business and the capitalists under this society. If you have a determined enough struggle, if they think it's easier to give in than to fight any further from the point of view of their system, we can win things. Our sister organisation in the US has got one councillor, it's a bit more like an MP uh, from the point of view of the size, but one councillor in Seattle has led a movement of low-paid workers demanding a $15 an hour minimum wage, and they've won it. And that idea is now spreading like wildfire across America. Other cities are introducing the same thing. So you can win it. And we could win £10 an hour, which is what we're fighting for in Britain at this point in time. But at the same time, you can win it, but they'll always take it back. They're already trying to undermine the $15 an hour by trying to say tips are included and this concession and that concession. They'll always try and grab it back off you as they fight to maximise their profits. And in the end... <laughs> The only way to permanently end austerity is to have a society where you take the ownership of the, time, of the, uh, the ownership of the economy out of a tiny group of people at the top. Something like 500 companies control 70% of world trade. 120 companies in Britain dominate 80% of the economy. Take those huge companies into democratic public ownership and then you could begin to build an Assad society where asking for free education, for a decent job, for the right to retire when you still had some life left, a secure home over your, over your head. Those things were not something outrageous as they're becoming under capitalism, but a guarantee that everybody should be able to have. So for us, we think we can fight austerity, but crucial to that is also fighting for a socialist world and a different society. I'll leave it there.